Hi, I'm Jean Liu, and I'm an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, or ear, nose, and throat doctor here in Los Angeles. I wanted today to talk about tonsils, briefly what are they, but also why do we ever take them out of anyone. Tonsils are part of the body's immune system, along with the lymph nodes, the adenoids, the appendix. They're all clumps of lymphatic tissue that help fight off infection. Lucky for us, the body has a lot of built-in redundancy, so if any one of these body parts gets overwhelmed or overrun by viruses, bacteria, you name it, and they cause more problems than they're worth, there's really zero consequences to getting rid of them. The only downside is going through the anesthesia and surgery to have it done. There are two main types of problems for which we'll take out the tonsils. On the one hand, it's infectious etiologies or infectious reasons, and the other is obstructive, where the tonsils are big enough that they're causing some sort of blockage. Current guidelines say that if you get seven severe bouts of tonsillitis in one year, it's probably time to get rid of them. Alternatively, if you get five in a year for two years in a row, or three per year for three years or more, it might make sense. Keep in mind, not every little sore throat counts. What we're looking for are more severe bouts that last longer, likely with high fever, certainly if they're caused by strep, if the lymph nodes are swollen. Those episodes, we would absolutely count. More minor episodes where you just have a scratchy throat for a few days, perhaps you don't miss any school or work, you never take an antibiotic, those are less concerning. But simply counting the number of infections is oversimplified. Even if it's not strep, even if you don't have high fever or swollen lymph nodes, if the episodes are long enough, dragging on, you're missing lots of school or work, that may be enough reason to justify it. We also typically throw in some other fudge factors. For example, if somebody is already developing a lot of antibiotic resistance, where amoxicillin used to work, but now it doesn't, and you're onto Augmentin, and perhaps even onto Omnicef, if you're two, three, four antibiotics in, and it's not getting better, or the old antibiotics no longer work, then it's more concerning, and we're more likely to take out the tonsils to avoid future bouts of antibiotics. It also depends on how well you're tolerating the medication. So in somebody who has a lot of allergic reactions to medications, and if you're prone to developing diarrhea or GI or gastrointestinal upset from the medications, then again, we may be moving a little earlier to take out the tonsils so that you don't have to take nearly as much medication. Other times, people can develop an abscess or a pocket of pus around the tonsil. In those cases where you need a needle or a scalpel poked in to drain the pus, it's not going to take many of those episodes before somebody wants their tonsils out. Other times, we'll see one episode of tonsillitis that drags on, or chronic tonsillitis, where the tonsils are inflamed, angry, swollen, uncomfortable, and no matter what you do and what medications you take, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, it drags on for a couple of months straight, that one episode by itself is probably enough. When it comes to the obstructive symptoms, obstructive sleep apnea is the most common reason why we take out tonsils these days. Apnea is when the tonsils are swollen, and when you go to sleep at night, the muscles relax, the tonsils fall into the back of your throat and strangle your breathing and chop up your sleep. It really creates a problem of preventing even happy airflow. If you have sleep apnea, sometimes it's super obvious. What you get is a lot of gasping and choking and frequent awakenings. Sometimes it can be more subtle, where the airflow just stops. In either circumstance, it can disrupt the sleep. Obviously, if you're physically waking up all the time, that's going to cause a problem. More subtle is when it doesn't allow your body to fully relax. You don't get all the way into the deep stage 4 REM sleep, so you don't get rejuvenated no matter how much you sleep. Sometimes when we hear from apnea patients is that they are good sleepers and that they need a lot of sleep, but at the end of the day, they're run down and tired during the daytime. That's not good sleep. In adults, we typically complain of fatigue, meaning you're not well rested. You wake up, you're tired, you're run down, you're more likely to need a lot of coffee. You're also more likely to fall asleep behind the wheel or in meetings. And generally, you might be a little bit of a bear to be around. For kids, sleep apnea may also show up in the same things with fatigue, poor school performance, but it may also show up with more ADHD type behavior where because they're not well rested, they're lashing out, they're a little hyper. 
Another thing that we sometimes see in children is that once you've outgrown bedwetting, regress again. Having sleep apnea is extra physical strain and stress on your body and your heart. It increases your risk of high blood pressure that's hard to control, but it also gives you a shorter life expectancy and increased risk of heart attack and stroke. Ultimately, all of that extra strain takes its toll on your system. I wanted to clarify a difference between simple snoring and sleep apnea. Snoring is when the airflow at night is really loud. There's no health consequence. Your body is well rested. You're not more run down. There's no increased risk of heart attack or stroke or high blood pressure. The only danger to your health from simple snoring is if your partner clubs you over the head because you're too loud. It absolutely can affect your quality of life if your partner is always pissed off at you and they can't sleep. But doing surgery for simple snoring is something that we do with a little more hesitation. Other type of obstructive symptoms could be that if the tonsils take up a lot of room in the back of your throat, you're more likely to stick your tongue forward, keep your jaw a little bit more open. That can lead to dry mouth and dental problems, but that can also lead to development of a lower face that's more long and narrow and jaws that are more crowded. So not only are you more likely as a child to need braces and orthodontics, you're more likely to need jaw splints, jaw spanders, and maybe orthognathic surgery. These facial development issues of the jaw aren't just cosmetic. As you get older into adulthood, those narrow airways and narrow jaws can lead to blockage and obstructive issues and speech and swallowing issues much later down the road. Although we occasionally see big tonsils causing gagging, choking, and swallowing problems, it's really rare. In those rare circumstances where we think it's coming from the tonsils, it certainly makes sense to remove them as well. A few times a year, we'll take out the tonsils for people who have tonsil stones. Tonsil stones are little white yellow flecks of partially digested food that get trapped in the little pockets of the tonsils. Sometimes if water picks, gargling, rinsing, Q-tips can't get them out and keep them out, and it's significantly affecting your quality of life, then one way to guarantee you never get tonsil stones again is to take out the entire tonsil. We also, in rare circumstances, will find a mass or a lump or an ulcer on the tonsil, and a biopsy is needed. Biopsying part of a tonsil is certainly possible, but there are times where we'll choose to remove the entire tonsil to get the entire specimen. What I've talked about is the list of the most common reasons why we would take somebody's tonsils out. It's not an exhaustive list. And our guidelines do allow some leeway for physicians and patients to make a collaborative decision on when it might make sense or not. Medicine isn't cookie cutter, so it's not simply counting the number of infections, for example. At the end of the day, if you think you have enough problems with your tonsils, Find an ear, nose, and throat doctor in your area, go visit them, and have a discussion around why and when it would make sense to take out your tonsils. One last note, we almost always take out the adenoids when somebody's getting their tonsils out. Adenoids are very similar to tonsils, but live behind the nose in what we call the nasopharynx. If you think about the area where you're drinking a soda, you laugh, and it squirts around the back, that's where the adenoids live. Because you can't see them easily by just opening your mouth in the office, people a lot of times forget or don't even know that they're there. But taking out the adenoids is a super quick and easy procedure. And if you're going through a tonsillectomy, and if you have any adenoid tissue at all, we pretty much always take it out at the same time. I hope this gave you some useful information about what the tonsils are and when we would take them out. If you have any additional questions, please leave it in the comments below.